beautiful, beautiful, beautiful people. Today, we are going to see a door forced open. We will look at the Opium Wars, the Taiping Rebellion, and the self-strengthening movement of uh, Qing China. Let us get started here. Let us get started. We are going back into China. We have developed the Canton system where Europeans and the Americans are allowed to trade in China in one designated town outside of the city walls. It's heavily regulated. This is the agreement because the Qing dynasty is making a tremendous amount of money, but we don't want these European powers coming into the nation, causing trouble, causing uh, uh, chaos, etc., the Canton system works. The Canton system works for both parties. However, the British want more. And so we saw in our last lesson, uh, George McCartney try to negotiate better terms. However, he is told clearly by uh, the Queen Long Emperor, we don't want your goods. We don't want your goods. We have everything that we want. Um, and so it's either this or nothing. He will further, further bar all Europeans from even entering into the Forbidden City. He wants nothing to do with these European powers entering into China. Well, this will bring us to the infamous Opium Wars. There will be two Opium Wars, and these two Opium Wars will have two giant effects. One it will finally prove how far behind China had fallen militarily. It had been in denial. China had been in denial for over a century now. And two, it would force China to open itself up to Western trade. Again, whether they like it or not, China is going to open itself up to Western trade. Background. Well, from the 1700s to the 1800s, uh, trade within China continued to be very, very, very profitable. It was dominated by the British East India Company, uh, which was expanding its operations from India, although other Western powers were certainly there. European consumers fall in love with Chinese goods, and so the Canton system works. It works for merchants, for trading companies that are buying Asian goods and selling them to their fellow countrymen. People are making a very, very large profit, including the Americans. The Americans are now entering the world's stage. However, the British have a major problem. The British have a major problem, which we're going to get to in a little bit. We can't enter the city. Canton is the only city in which we can deal with. That being said, that being said, people are making fortunes. I said this, but I'm going to say it again. European markets, American markets uh, are eager to consume uh, Chinese tea, making a fortune, an absolute fortune off of Chinese tea. Here's some imperial tea from China uh, selling to, I believe, the British market. Europeans fall in love with uh, Chinese tea. China. Oh, how do you get that name? Oh, wait a minute. What is what is less? What is more Victorian than a, a, a beautiful porcelain China set? But it's not just uh, 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 tea sets. Everything Chinese becomes very fashionable among the wealthy and middle class of Western Europe and the United States by the early middle 1800s. Absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Chinese silk, as advanced as European and American textiles were by the early modern, uh, sorry, by the early uh, uh, middle 1800s, Chinese silks become incredibly fashionable. You are not considered a Victorian lady if you do not have a Chinese silken gown. We get the material in China. We bring it to uh, British factories where they process it and then tailors make these beautiful gowns. These are the heights. This is the height of Victorian fashion. 
from China, directly from China, that material. Look at these ladies. Look at these ladies. What a Victorian vision. Chinese silks, Chinese tea set, drinking Chinese tea. My God. Consumers fall in love, and people are making giant profits. It is very common by the middle 1800s to have Chinese wares in your home. Chinese table, we can see here, a Chinese screen in the background. Europeans fall in love with the Orient. It's exotic. It is, it is mysterious. Very similar to how Europeans fell in love with India as well. It was entirely not uncommon to have a China room in your mansion if you were uh, an aristocrat, a noble, or simply a wealthy industrialist. Buckingham Palace itself, the home of the British royal family, uh, to this day boasts of a Chinese dining room with wares from China, most likely coming through the Canton system. However, Europeans have a problem. Europeans have a problem, especially the British, who dominate trade with the uh, Chinese. You see, the Chinese don't want any European goods. They don't want any European goods. This is a market. This is a market. By the middle 1800s, the Chinese population is over 430 million. That's 430 million missing customers, just like today. Western companies are eager for the Chinese market, and they're not taking anything. The only thing they're demanding, the only thing that they will take from Europeans and American traders is silver. They'll take silver, and they will sell Westerners our their goods. Well, that is not good for profit. That is terrible for profit. The British, Europeans, and the Americans are pumping China full of silver and not having any of their goods bought and sold on the Chinese market. The effect European merchants, merchants um, have to separate themselves from very valuable silver in order to do business in China. From the middle 1600s, from the middle 1600s, 28 million kilograms of silver had been received by China. That is not good for profit. That is not good for profit. A huge trade deficit had been created between the Western powers and the Chinese. Well, what can we get the Chinese to want? What can we get the Chinese that they don't have, but they want? Well, Leave it to the East India Company, the British East India Company, to come up with a wonderful solution. My God, genius, 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 genius. The solution, the solution is opium. The solution is opium. British traders begin importing opium from India for sale in China to make up for the imbalance. The Qing government protests and they are ignored they are ignored it begins in the 1700s but by the 1830s the british begin pumping china illegally full of opium now opium grows in the mountains of afghanistan right uh, above british held india afghanistan is not a particularly fertile part of the world but the poppy seems to grow very very happily in the mountains of Afghanistan, what they do is they cut the poppy and milk uh, is, is, is extracted. It leaks the poppy milk. Uh, that dries. That dries into a hardened uh, substance. They scrape it with their uh, knives and they get themselves opium. Now, opium had been used in China for many, many centuries for medicinal purposes, certainly. But this is different. This is not medicine this is smoked it's highly addictive and for a population that is oftentimes hungry that is oftentimes overworked it is very attractive if you can escape if you can escape in a cloud of opium smoke um it's very attractive 
it's very, very attractive. Uh, in The Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy is running with the Tin Man, the Lion, and the Scarecrow, and they run through that field of poppy and they fall asleep, it's this poppy. It's this poppy. That's the part they don't tell you in the film. I don't know if they smoked it or not. Uh, I wasn't there, but you get the picture. Anyways, they begin shipping this product into China. Into China. Um, again, they began doing this in the 1700s. And time and time again, the Qing dynasty has protested. And time and time again, the British have ignored these protests. The British are finally, finally starting to shrink that trade deficit. Finally, they are uh, not having to pump China uh, with British held silver. They begin to pump China full of this highly addictive, highly destructive drug. Look at that jump in the 1830s. Look at that jump in the 1830s of opium imports into China. Well, the effects. The British found an instant instant consumer market for the drug um, and thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, will become highly addicted. The flow of silver slows down and then it begins to be reversed. They stop importing silver into China, period, because they are making so much money on the illegal trade of, of, of opium. Now, since the 1700s, the Chinese government did allow small numbers for medicine, but they time and time again ask the British and other European authorities to please halt with your opium imports, and they are largely ignored. Um, they continue to pump China full of, of thousands of pounds of opium. Let me give you a figure. By the 1820s, by the 1820s, China was importing 900 tons of Bengali opium a year, 900 tons of Bengali opium a year. In 1839, sorry, by 1839, pardon me, by 1839, 1,400 tons per year getting pumped into China. Time and time again, the Qing emperors will demand an end, and time and time again, they are ignored. It's very attractive for a peasant who is sore, who is hungry. Um, opium is a, is, it, it's, it's a painkiller. It's, it's the painkiller in the natural world. And so a readily, a readily uh, uh, interested market emerges among the peasantry of China. Much to the shock and the disgust of the authorities. You cannot have a population addicted to this drug, which makes you want to stop working on top of everything else. In 1839, the emperor appointed a new Confucian commissioner, Lin Zexu, uh, to control the opium trade through Canton. Now, his first move, Zexu's first move, was to enforce laws already on the books. He wants to enforce laws already on the books. And when the British refused to end the trade, Lin blockaded the British traders in their factories and cut off supplies of food. It was then that Captain Charles Elliot, Captain Charles Elliot finally agreed that all British subjects should turn over their opium. However, Elliot says he was promised that they would be paid for that opium. They were never paid. The British will use this as the excuse to go to war with China. They hand over their opium, and they are never compensated. The British will later cite this as the primary reason why they decided to go to war. It gives the British a reason, a substantial reason to go to war, because the Chinese never paid them back for the loss of their product, which they were not supposed to have in Canton in the first place. Suppression. Suppression. The Chinese then under Lin begin to suppress the opium, the illegal opium trade in China. They seize supplies in British factories, warehouses. They boarded British ships in international waters outside of Chinese jurisdiction where their cargo was still legal. From the British point of view, you can't board our ship outside of Chinese waters and take our opium. They do. They do. They seized 20,000 chests in total, about six months 
worth of imports into China, the Chinese government seizes and destroys. Then Lin demands that British merchants sign a bond promising not to deal in opium under penalty of death. The British officially opposed signing the bond, even though many merchants uh, wanted to sign the bond um, just to get out of trouble. But the British officially refused to sign such a bond. Um, and so the seizing of ships continues outside of China. Here is the destruction of opium in China under this reformer. This is money. We are losing money. We're going to lose silver soon if they can't, uh, uh, if we can't get opium into the, the Middle Kingdom. Lin then pens a letter to Queen Victoria herself, at this time a young queen, where he begs her to listen to his demands, China's demands. He wrote, this is to Queen Victoria of Great Britain, the one day uh, Empress of India, not there yet. Your honorable nation takes away the products of our central land. And not only do you thereby obtain food and support yourselves, but moreover, by reselling these products to other countries, you reap a threefold profit. Now, if you would not sell opium, this threefold profit would be secured to you. How can you possibly consent, forgo it for a drug that is hurtful to men? and an unbridled craving after gain that seems to know no bounds. Let us suppose that foreigners came from another country and brought opium into England and seduced the people of your country to smoke it. Would you not, the sovereign of said country, look upon such a procedure with anger and in your indignation endeavor to get rid of it? He then warns Britain. He warns Britain. Our celestial empire rules over 10,000 kingdoms. Most surely do we possess a measure of godlike majesty, which ye cannot fathom. Still, we cannot bear to slay or exterminate without previous warning. And it is for this reason that we now clearly make known to you the fixed laws of our land. He's telling, he's telling Britain, don't mess with the Middle Kingdom. We are far beyond any other nation. Well, they're still living in the 1600s at this point. He then goes on to condemn the queen. It's illegal in your land. Why is it legal? Why are you bringing it to China? Well, actually, it was fully legal in Britain. Britain really won't uh, 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 tackle opium until the early 1900s, along with the United States. You can still get it at a drugstore at this time, but he thinks that it's illegal um, in, in Britain as well. So he's given Britain a warning. He's given the queen a warning. Um, it is not known if she ever actually received the letter, although it was published in the Times. Um, the British government and the British merchants of Canton offer no response to, to Lin for his questions. Um, they simply accused him of destroying their property. And when the British government learned of what was taking place in Canton, remember, it took months for news in China to reach uh, London, uh, they decide to send in the British Indian Army. They send in the British Indian Army to punish China, to protect British interests in China. We are going to war. The first opium war. This is Great Britain against the, the, the kingdom, the empire of China. As soon as British ships arrived, uh, hostilities broke out. Instantly, the Chinese forces were completely overwhelmed about 20,000 versus 200,000 British soldiers uh, the British military superiority um, and their new technologies quickly showed the Chinese that they were well behind European standards of technology um, additionally Additionally, the British troops fought very, very well. The Indian Army fought incredibly well against many Chinese soldiers who simply didn't want to be there anyways. Chinese cannons and firearms belonged in another century. They were completely behind European uh, uh, technologies. And on top of it, tax revenue collapses. The Qing suddenly become desperate for money. With war... With the freezing of European trade, their economy collapses during the uh, first opium war. It wasn't even close. 
It wasn't even close. An island nation, thousands of miles away, is 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 making a fool of the Middle Kingdom, the center of the cultural and physical world. This was a a shock and a wake up call for many in China, and it also confirmed every suspicion that the British had that they were far superior to all nations outside of Europe. It confirms a lot of their prejudices as well. Very antiquated weaponry on the side of the uh, Chinese. 1842. In 1842, the Qing agree to peace with the British. They understand they're not winning. They are not winning. And they sign the Treaty of Nanking. The Treaty of Nanking. Negotiations begin in 1842. These terms were very, very skewed towards the British. Um, very much so. Let's look at the terms that the Chinese have to sign under the Treaty of Nanking or Nanjing. You'll see both spelling. One uh, 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 is the old way of spelling it and the other is the new way of spelling it. Anyways, China was forced to pay an indemnity to Britain. China was forced to pay an indemnity, a uh, fine to the British for destroying their property. They were forced to open up four more ports to Britain. They were forced to give uh, the city of Hong Kong, the small city at that time, uh, to Queen Victoria. Great Britain will take over Hong Kong. And British subjects were granted extraterritorial privileges in treaty ports. What does extraterritoriality mean? It means that the British in China were subject only to British law, not Chinese law. When the British were in these port cities, they were under British law still, not under Chinese law. Furthermore, the British got most favored status, meaning any terms granted to other nations, Britain automatically gets. Let's say that the Chinese cut another deal with the Americans, granting them certain privileges. Britain already instantly gets those um, benefits, those uh, special uh, uh, privileges. Uh, the United States and France will force similar treaties on China at this time. The signing of the Treaty of Nanjing or Nanking. This is the first of many treaties that the Chinese call to this day the unfair treaties, very biased towards Western powers. Here are British medals made with the silver sent by the Chinese to pay back for the destroyed opium. They make medals with the silver celebrating their victory over the Chinese. These are the additional port cities to be opened up, open to the British. Later, other European powers will find their way in there. China is being forced open um, through musket fire. William Gladstone, William Gladstone, future prime minister of England, spoke in Parliament over what he believed was a terrible, terrible treaty uh, that the British forced upon the Chinese. Now, he's British. He is British. He said this. If there had ever been, quote, a war more unjust in its origin, a war more calculated to cover this country with permanent disgrace, I do not know. There were many in Great Britain that believed what the British had done was completely unjust, completely unmoral, and behavior not befitting such a, a grand kingdom. Nevertheless, Britain is controlled. Britain is dominated by wealthy merchants who are not going to let the Chinese uh, 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 push who they believed were a much more civilized, great nation uh, around uh, the former president, John Quincy Adams, spoke up in support of the treaties, saying that China was simply arrogant and greedy and needed to be taught a lesson. And so the former president of the United States and former secretary of state was all for the forcing of this treaty upon the Chinese. Here is a, I believe, a French cartoon. 
depicting the British as no better than uh, drug pushers. And in many respects, I'm not taking a judgment call on this. I try not to. Um, it certainly appeared that way, all in the interest of profit. Remember, the British Empire was an empire built on profit, trade, commerce, capitalism. The British got to take over Hong Kong and begins a very long, complex history of the British holding a city on mainland China. British Hong Kong, 1841 to 1997. Here we have a British city with a Chinese population off of the coast of mainland China. For more than 100 years, the British will control Hong Kong. And you get a beautiful blending of British culture and Chinese culture in this city. It's a city-state. Think of a city-state. It's not a country. It's a city and a country within itself. But it was a possession of the British Empire up until 1997. If you look at old images of Hong Kong in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, it, it really is... Uh, um, a beautiful blending of these two cultures. Part British, part Chinese, 100% Hong Kong. The people of Hong Kong were given all the rights of anyone within the British Empire. Access to education, technology, etc. English common law. Subjects of the empire, as they were referred to. In the 1980s, the British agreed to give back Hong Kong to the Chinese under the condition that the Chinese would respect Hong Kong semi-independence, that Hong Kong would be able to rule itself, but be under the power of the Chinese government. And the Chinese agreed to this. And so in 1997, in 1997, the British handed over control of Hong Kong over to the Chinese government. There's the final lowering of the British flag over Hong Kong. They are giving it over to the last governor of Hong Kong. Now, many Hong Kongese were very nervous. They told the British the Chinese are not going to respect this agreement. They are not going to allow us to remain as free as we were under the British crown. Well, in recent years, the Chinese have begun to further and further regulate Hong Kong, take away many of their privileges not enjoyed by other Chinese cities. Increasingly, the Chinese Communist government has begun to take over more control over Hong Kong, um, and take away less rights that would, had one time been enjoyed under the British Empire. And this saw massive protests, massive protests across Hong Kong, largely peaceful, largely peaceful protests against the Chinese government. And among the crowd, and this is not a majority, I'm not telling you that's a majority at all, you do see Union Jacks, because that represents pre-communist Hong Kong, pre-Chinese rule Hong Kong. China now says that Hong Kong was never a colony of the British. It certainly was. It certainly was. And I'm not saying for a minute that the people out there protesting want to return to Britain. They don't. They don't for the most part. But it's just interesting to see these, these remnants, these remnants of, 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 of a past era. We shall see what happens with Hong Kong in the future. The Second Opium War. One was not good enough. Well, similar to the first, the Chinese did not hold to all of the terms of the Treaty of Nanking, uh, and they continue to board British ships. They board a British, a British registered ship. It's a pirate ship. It's called the Arrow. It's a Chinese ship, but it's registered uh, to the British. They board the ship. They board the ship. The British demanded an apology. The Chinese refused, and it was war. The 
British were looking for any reason to start a war, um, that even the French, even the French get involved in this war. Now, the French say um, it's to protect, it's to protect uh, uh, Christian missionaries in the region that they want to get involved now. They want, they want more ports themselves. And so the second opium war saw Great Britain and France, uh, very rarely th are they together during this time, but even th this can bring the British and the French together. Uh, it's the second opium war. The Chinese will be defeated and forced to sign more treaties, opening up their nation even more. At Tietzin, they are forced to sign a series of unfair treaties. This time, the Russians, the French, the Americans are all there for the signing of these treaties. They're all eager to get a taste of the Chinese market. Again, very, very one-sided treaties. Under the terms, under the terms, 10 new treaty ports were opened up to trade with Western pow powers. Now 10 more cities are opened up. Foreign diplomats were allowed to be at the capital, Peking, later Beijing, the capital. Now you can open it up to foreign diplomats. You can't just simply close the doors of the uh, imperial uh, uh, complex. The opium trade was legalized, but regulated by the Chinese authorities. We are forcing a nation to legalize our drug that we're pushing on them. Uh, Kowloon on the mainland opposite Hong Kong Island was, was, was surrendered to the British. Permission was granted for foreigners to travel throughout their country, including Christian missionaries, including Christian missionaries. Now we'll see Christian missionaries burst out into the Chinese mainland. British ships were allowed to carry indentured Chinese to the Americas. They were allowed to now carry Chinese to the Americas, giant effects on the American West. And an indemnity of 3 million ounces of silver was paid to Great Britain 2 million ounces of silver to France. Finally, Russia gets a port city. We take a port city from the Chinese. Vladivostok, pardon me, um, is secured from China and given to the Russians. By the 1860s, there'll be 14 treaty ports along the coast and up the rivers of China. China is humiliated. China is humiliated, and it's now that many Chinese really recognize we need to modernize. We need to modernize. They are just going to take, take, take. Treaties of Tietzin. More and more treaty towns are opened up to Western powers. The capital of Peking or Beijing is open up to foreign diplomats. Now they will be there with the Qing emperor. Here we go, down on the coast here. You see Russia is desperate for Pacific ports. This all gets frozen in the winter. All this gets frozen in the winter. So they really want a year-round port to have a Pacific fleet. That's very important to the empire of Russia. We'll get into that later on at another time. But at the same time, that the other powers are rising in Europe, so is Imperial Russia. With the legalization of opium, um, this epidemic continues throughout the 1800s. Absolutely terrible, terrible effects on China because of it. You can see men don't eat, men don't work. It's highly addictive. And if you give it up, you will have terrible, terrible withdrawals. This is what much of China has been reduced to. British East India opium. Some of these are from the early 1900s, just so you know. There's kind of mixed. Opium dens will spread to cities like San Francisco, London, Paris. Europeans and Americans will soon 
learn the seductive charms of this terrible drug. It won't be until the early 1900s that these are really cracked down, though. It's not just the Chinese that grow highly addictive. With the opening up of China, with the uh, uh, Second Opium War treaties, now we begin to see large numbers of Chinese making their way to the Americas, usually on British ships, either directly into San Francisco for the gold fields of the Sierra Nevada or into British Columbia, and they come down illegally into the United States. The Chinese, like thousands, many thousands of other, mostly men, are there for the gold. They are there for the gold. They arrive in San Francisco right alongside uh, Europeans, people from the East Coast, but they're there for the gold. And you can see there are some Chinese alongside Mexicans, Europeans, people from New York, Chicago, uh, Texas. They were called celestials uh, sometimes by the Americans in California because of, China was referred to sometimes as the celestial kingdom. This man is angry at that dog for some reason. I think he's going to throw that glass and so into the foothills of California, you have um, Chinese uh, mining camps. Now, they were not allowed to uh, uh, camp with, alongside uh, Americans. And foreigners, all foreigners, had to pay special taxes to uh, mine the Sierras. This was because it was, it, was, it was understood that this was American gold, and so foreigners should have to pay a special tax. But when you look at these old images, you will oftentimes see the Chinese are there right alongside uh, in some places, in quite large numbers. Now, the Chinese couldn't camp with uh, white Americans. Oftentimes, when you read the primary source material, they prefer that. They found the uh, Americans uh, to be drunk, loud, prone towards violence. Very hard workers. Very hard workers. Very industrious. Industrious, pardon me. This is a population map of, 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 of the Chinese during this time in small pockets in the Sierras. And when silver and gold strikes are found in other locations in the West, you will see numbers of Chinese travel with other prospectors trying to get that gold out of those mountains. This is a Chinese population map fanning out across the American West into Eastern towns, facing a lot of discrimination for the record. And they will soon be barred they were seen as undercutting American labor, willing to work for far less than their white counterparts. That is one of the reasons why they were chosen to uh, build the western half of the uh, transcontinental railroad. They were more reliable, less prone to drinking, and worked for less than their white counterparts. And if it wasn't for the Chinese, the transcontinental railroad would not been, have been built in, 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 in the record time that it was. Every West Coast American town had uh, a, a Chinese laundry. Now, the Chinese were very clever in the United States. If you have many thousands of men with money in their pockets, not a lot, but money, uh, and no women, they're not going to do their own laundry. They're not going to cook their own food. And so Chinese laundries emerge. Chinese restaurants emerge in the middle and late 1800s, bringing with them their food for the American audience, for the American consumer. This is the first time we have Chinese food in, 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 in the United States. Uh, when we get to the Taiping Rebellion, that's going to force a lot of Chinese out of the country because of the terrible violence that, that takes place. But they bring their food and their culture to the United States, and we've been hooked ever since. I recently read there are more Chinese restaurants in this country than McDonald's. I don't know if that's true, but I believe everything I read on the internet, because right, the internet doesn't lie. Uh, there are more Chinese restaurants than, um, than, than, than uh, uh, McDonald's restaurants in the United States. Chinatowns spring up across the West Coast. Um, they were forced to live here. But again, if you read the primary source material, they oftentimes appreciated not having to live alongside your typical American. Christian missionaries now move in to China. Now they are allowed 
to begin conversion of the Chinese. This is when we start to get large numbers of Protestant converts, but both Catholics and Protestants uh, push out deep into China, saving souls, as they would say. You can see these men dressed traditional Chinese garb. The Taiping Rebellion. Well, this message of Christianity is going to have a giant effect, and it will indirectly, indirectly lead to the Taiping Revolution or Rebellion. Pardon me. Really, this was a massive civil war in southern China against the Qing dynasty. It occurs at the same time that the Qing are dealing with those Western powers with the Second Opium War. So the Qing government is busy with Western powers fighting them. This is what allows this rebellion to take place. In the end, more than 20 million Chinese will die. 20 million Chinese will die. One of the most bloody wars of the modern era. War, famine, sickness will kill 20 million Chinese. Background. Well, apart from a series of humiliating defeats uh, by the Western powers, the Chinese Qing dynasty is suffering from a series of natural disasters, a series of economic disasters. It seems that they're losing their mandate of heaven, right? All these natural disasters, floods, uh, earthquakes, droughts. It seems that the mandate of heaven has been lifted from the Qing. And this is what usually brings revolution in China during this time. Moreover, <clears throat> farmers are being heavily overtaxed, rents are rising, and farmers begin to desert their lands, leading to famine. The Qing government were seen by the majority Han Chinese as ineffective. Ineffective. Remember, the majority of the uh, Chinese population is Han. The Qing dynasty is, 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 is a foreign government, a foreign rule. And they begin to believe that the mandate of heaven has been lifted. Anti-Manchu sentiment was strongest in the South, and this is where we begin to see rebellion. We begin to see rebellion, but a leader is going to emerge. A leader is going to emerge to unite these very angry, desperate people, and that is a Hong Shui Quan. Hong Shui Quan. I'm just going to call him Hong from now on. Um, I, I know I'm butchering these names, and that is not him, obviously, but I just wanted to put a face I wanted to put a face on this man. I think it's easier, but that's definitely not him. It's a very modern image. Now, this man was a lowly school teacher, a lowly school teacher, um, a Han Chinese. By age 37, Hong had failed on multiple occasions to pass the imperial examinations. He was denied access to the government class, the administration class. By his late 30s, he begins to experience a series of illnesses. And it's while suffering these illnesses that he begins to change. His neighbors say he's changing. Something's happening to this man. He's, he's changing. He begins to have horrible fevers, horrible fevers. Um, and with these fevers, he begins to have uh, visions. He begins to have visions. Well, he soon realizes that these visions are actually uh, 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 from the other world. These are divine images. And he realizes he's had a revelation. He's had a revelation, guys. In 1836, after studying the Bible, brought by those Christian missionaries, Hong claimed that the illnesses had, in fact, been a vision. And it was revealed to him that he was, in fact, the younger brother of Jesus. Yes, the younger brother of Jesus, who was sent to rid China of the devils. Not devil, devils. He has been sent to China. He's a messiah. 
to rid China of the devils. Who were the devils? Well, they were the corrupt Manchu rulers and the teachings of Confucius. Those are the devils destroying Chinese society. His goal, his duty, was to spread his interpretation of Christianity and to overthrow Manchu rule. By the 1840s, he is attracting a lot of supporters. And he takes his troops and he begins to uh, fight bandits. He begins to fight pirates in this southern region of China, gaining a lot of support. He's fighting crime with his band of Christian warriors. And he begins to, to gain a lot of support. But he also catches the attention of the Qing authorities. Here is Hong, the younger brother of Jesus, the son of God. He is a Christian warrior sent to save China. You see what happens when you allow Western thought into your land? Revolution. By 1850, it is all out revolution. Uh, it begins and stays mostly in the South. Uh, 10,000 rebel army led by Hong defeats government troops. He then amasses an army of half a million. People are flocking to his leadership, mostly Han, fighting against who they believe were alien rulers. By 1854, he has established a, uh, an independent nation state in the south of China. He named it the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, with a capital in Nanking, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. His army will soon grow to a million strong, and his territory will be a nation of over 100,000 square miles. This grows and grows and grows. The Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. Here is his army battling Qing troops. This is a, a later illustration. This is from the era. Remember, the Qing dynasty has been horribly, horribly weakened because of their battles with the Western powers. This is the throne in Nanking, where Hong would sit and dictate his commands. This is the extent of his power in the South. Hong tried to create what he believed could be heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. He wants to recreate Chinese society in a similar fashion to the French revolutionaries. From his capital of Nanking, he develops a highly centralized and militarized state and goes about recreating society according to his Protestant Christian interpretation of the Bible. Let's see how he attempts to recreate society. Well, he keeps the examinations. If you want a job in this government, he keeps the examinations. However, now, instead of being tested on Confucian teachings, you are tested on the Bible. So we are exchanging Confucian beliefs for Christian beliefs if you want to get a job in this new government. Private property. Private property uh, was abolished, and all land was held and distributed by the state. All land was taken by the state and redistributed to the Chinese peasants. This will be done again when the communists take over in 1949. What else? What else? A new calendar was uh, established. A solar calendar replaced the, the old lunar calendar. Foot binding was banned. Foot binding was banned. Now, it was never practiced. It was never practiced by uh, uh, many people in the South, but it was certainly practiced by some people in the South. Um, it's banned. It is banned. Um, society was declared classless, and the sexes were declared equal. Now, that didn't last. That didn't last, but that was the declaration. There was no classes, and the sexes are equal. Are we not all equal in the eyes of God? Does that not is that not what the Bible 
tells us. The sexes were rigorously separated. There were separate army units consisting of women only, and women were even appointed to government positions. Um, until 1855, not even married couples were allowed to live together or have relations because we are ushering in the second coming of God. Don't worry about living with your spouse. I'm bringing back, I'm bringing a, a, a God. I am the Messiah. The Qing dictated Q haircuts uh, were abandoned. They were banned. Um, and the more traditional long hair of the of the Han Chinese was reintroduced. We are trying to rid ourselves of these Manchu uh, uh, tenants. Other reforms under the Taiping. Now, this never happens throughout China. Please remember, this is just their little independent or semi, -in their attempted independent nation kingdom in the South. Uh, new laws were introduced, including the prohibition of opium. Opium is banned. Gambling is banned. Tobacco is banned. Alcohol is banned. Polygamy is banned. Slavery is banned. Prostitution is banned. All of them carry death penalties. We are trying to recreate society with the interpretation of one man. And some of these Chinese have to be forced to be free, do they not? There is a reason why Mao Zedong of the Communist Party, the man who will make China communist by the late 1940s, uh, will very much uh, make this man a hero. Hong has made a hero under Chinese propaganda later in the 40s and 50s, just so you know. How does this come to an end? How does this heavenly kingdom come to an end? Well, the Taiping rebels never gain support from the gentry, from the ruling class. They don't like these revolutions. They don't like land being taken from them and redistributed. The government was incredibly inept. The Taiping government was incredibly inept. They don't have a long history of self-rule in China, and so it begins to collapse. We've seen that happen before. Hong and many of the other leaders did not live up to uh, their own moral standards. Hong himself kept many concubines for the record. Land distribution never really happened, and so many peasants were angry. Many, Much of the land was simply given to Hong supporters and Hong uh, lieutenants. Furthermore, once the treaties were signed with the um, Qing dynasty, the French and the British helped them defeat the Taiping rebels. In 1864, Nanking will fall to Qing forces and Hong will commit suicide. He will commit suicide rather than face punishment by the Qing authorities. Here are Europeans helping in the suppression of these rebels. The Taiping rebels were bad for business and they're banning opium as well. The Western powers do not want to see the Taiping rebels succeed. What if all of China falls to these? That is bad for business. And so the British and the French will help the Qing defeat the Taiping. It was during this chaos, it was during this chaos that the Xin Yu coup occurs. What was the Xin Yu coup? Well, Xin Feng, the emperor, dies. Xin Feng dies, and two of his wives and his son seize power. The Dowager Xian, the Dowager Shishi, and the Dowager, oh, sorry, the Dowager, uh, Prince Gong seize power. It's a palace coup. They seize control. They are now in charge of China. This happens occasionally. Um, there were various factions, various children by the emperor. These three seize power. It is under this new government that the self-strengthening movement takes place. This was headed by Prince Gong. Prince Gong and others recognize that China needs to modernize. China needs to modernize or it is going to be conquered entirely. The self-strengthening movement, after a series of defeats, finally, finally, the Chinese begin to take seriously the necessity to modernize. Now, Prince Gong um, is all for it, uh, but he is going to face opposition from many within the Chinese ruling class, as well as the Empress Dowager Zhizhi. 
increasingly she is going to become more and more powerful at the expense of Prince Gong and other reformers. Just know that as much as they tried to reform, it was a little bit too little uh, and a little too late. Just please keep that in mind. Empress Shishi and other elites within Chinese government do not want to reform. Um, they do not want to become westernized. And so the Chinese, and it was a little too little, too late, but they try. They do try. What were their goals? What were the goals of the self-strengthening movement? In order to strengthen itself against the West, it was necessary to adopt Western military technology and armaments, arms. This could be achieved by establishing Western shipyards, Western arsenals, bringing in Western experts to help Chinese engineers and manufacturers make modern ships, modern cannons, modern muskets. The Chinese were certain, they were certain that once they learned from these foreign barbarians, as they called them, they could equal and then surpass these Chinese, or these foreign barbarians. And so they do establish arsenals, shipyards, they do bring in Western experts to mixed results. They're trying to modernize. They are trying to modernize. They finally realize that what worked in 1600 is not working in the late 1800s. The results. China did spend a tremendous amount on arms, manufacturing, training. However, however, the problem was even leaders that believed that they should reform militarily did not want to reform socially. They wanted to keep everything the same except for the military. And China was in a much more unhealthy state than that. They needed to reform everything if they wanted to keep these foreign barbarians out giant institutional changes were needed um but the social order the the social ruling class were just far too strong and she she becomes more and more powerful and she is not interested in reform this is a perfect example this is a perfect example the marble boat the marble boat now originally the marble boat was built in 1755 it is destroyed during the second opium war however they rebuild it during this time. In 1893, under the orders of Empress uh, uh, Shishi, they rebuild it. They spend a fortune on this marble ship, which is mostly wood painted to be marble. This became a symbol, okay? Rather than spend this needed money on real naval ships, Shishi and the Chinese government spent a fortune on this it doesn't move it doesn't float it doesn't move about that becomes a perfect painful example of how slow china was willing to modernize they would rather spend a fortune on this that has no military advantage than actually building up its military now the chinese do better than was expected against the uh, french during the uh Franco-Sino War of 84 to 85. The French don't do nearly as well as they should have, uh, but it, for the most part, it's a stalemate. No one wins, no one loses. But what China does lose in the Franco-Sino War um, was its influence over Southeast Asia. Very, very important here. The Chinese lose influence over Indochina, Southeast Asia, which had been a protectorate uh, up until the late 1800s under the Qing. Here are French troops in Southeast Asia. Not the last time there'll be French troops in Southeast Asia. And so this part of the world becomes under French influence. And so that is a giant consequence. Little by little, the French begin to take over what will later become Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, etc. The next threat to China comes from Japan. Up to the 1800s, Japan, um, not subservient to China, 
but was influenced heavily by China. By the 1800s, China is emerging as a real power in the region. This is where we have the first Sino-Japanese War. The Japanese, which we're going to look at in a future lesson, have been modernizing. But they've been doing a very, 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 very good job of it. And they've not only just m focused on the military, they have modernized society, government, etc. And when they go against the Qing dynasty, who is getting punched left, right, and center, they do very well. They do very well. By the late 1800s, the Japanese are emerging as a real force. A real force. This is the small samurai taking on the mighty uh, power of the Qing and defeating them. This was a, an eye-opener to many in the world. It resulted, it resulted with the modern technologies of the Japanese. Um, it resulted in Japan taking full control over Taiwan and indirect control over Korea. Korea now comes under the Japanese influence. We see the collapse of the Qing and the rise of the Japanese in the late 1800s. We then, if it couldn't get worse, it does have the Boxer Rebellion. This was a violent anti-foreign and anti-Christian movement which took place across China. At first, at first, Empress Shishi will support these rebels, <clears throat> but soon it becomes very apparent it is out of control, and the Qing will attempt to suppress these rebels. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese Christians will be killed. Western powers get involved. Western powers get involved to suppress this boxer rebellion. It is a humiliating event in Chinese history. Here is the execution of boxers after the rebellion. Following the boxer rebellion, the Europeans have even more of an influence over Chinese affairs. Here we see all the Western powers that were there for their own interests. The British, the Americans, Australians, the British Indian, the German, the Frenchman, the Austria-Hungarian, the Russian, and the Japanese. All of these great imperial powers are beginning to carve up China into spheres of influence. Not direct rule, but spheres of influence. By 1912, this is how China has been carved up into spheres of influence. Now, the Qing still rule in name, but all of these regions are under some sort of foreign influence, semi-control, humiliating to the uh, Middle Kingdom. The end of the Qing dynasty occurred... Uh, with the birth of the Chinese Republic. After a great many years of fighting, the Chinese Republic is established in 1912. The young emperor, Puyi, seen there on the right, uh, must abdicate. He must abdicate. The child emperor abdicates. Now, Puyi is a very sad, sad uh, 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 story. He will um, later be put on the throne of uh, by the Japanese, we'll get there in a minute. But with the rise, uh, with with the emergence of the Chinese Republic, which will last until the Communist Revolution of 1949, the old Qing Emperor they don't kill him. They don't kill him. He lives as a, as a semi prisoner. Um, then the Japanese bring him out and make him a puppet emperor of a new puppet kingdom uh, in Manchuria. A very, very sad story. The Ch Japanese conquer much of China and make him a puppet emperor over northern China, Manchuria. The rise of Japan is for another lesson. Here you can see the puppet kingdom of Manchuria. We will look at China. We, I mean, at Japan, certainly, certainly, certainly. Um, but not in our next lesson. In our next lesson, we are leaving East Asia and going back to Europe for the time being. Thank you all very, very, very much until we meet again.